Welcome back. I'm here with Nate Northway. Nate, you run sound for? Falling in reverse. And? And a day to remember. And? And some other things I can't talk about right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, thank you for having me here. Um, let me ask you this. How'd you get to running sound? Uh, well, like a lot of us, I played in bands. And, Failed musician. Uh, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. You know, it, uh, it started out as, uh, you know, someone has to record the music and we couldn't afford to pay anybody to do it. So started uh, kind of figuring out how to record my bands and that eventually led into doing, you know, multiple local bands and, and that type of thing. And uh, eventually, you know, just made connections through that to a couple of people who were in the live world. And uh, yeah, had a friend who was going on tour for the first time. He's like, man, you ought to come out and, and do some live sound. I'm like, man, I don't know anything about that, but I gave it a crack and fell in love with it. And here I am. 20 years later, <laughs> you know? Jeez, dude. So. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, let's uh, connect the dots for me from, to Falling in Reverse. How'd you get connected with that? Um, so I have been mixing uh, a day to remember for nearly 10 years and they share management. Have been um, 10 years? Yeah, started with them in 2015. Cool. So yeah, it'll be 10 years next year. Which one's your favorite one on camera? Oh no, I can't, I can't talk <laughs> like that. So help connect the dots for me. How'd you get to uh, Falling in Reverse? Ah, uh, yeah, so I've been mixing A Day to Remember for uh, 10 years or so, and uh, they share tenure. management. Yeah, it is. Oh. I love those guys, man. I consider them you know, friends, family, and employers. With sharing management and just sure. kind of being in the same orbit as uh, Falling in Reverse for some time, there have been several opportunities over the years yeah. where you know, I just couldn't make it work. And, uh, and last year, Data Remember was off and these guys were on cycle and they ended up needing me and it just kind of the stars aligned. I really enjoy mixing the band, you know, it's, uh, I'm glad I got the opportunity to do it. It's, it's, a, it's a great band and uh, Ronnie, the singer, is an uh, iconic singer and a great singer. Um, but let's get into, before we get into that, um, could you do a little bit of a rig rundown? Yeah, a bit? of course. Uh, I see a S6L here. S6, um, yeah. Is this something that you run with all of your shows? Uh, yeah, so or, I... I'm sorry, not shows, but all your bands? Yeah, I, I started using this in 2016, I think. Um, you know, like a lot of us, I was on profile for a long time before that. And uh, when the profile kind of started becoming a dinosaur, it was a little bit of a search for what's next. Yeah. Uh, this had a little bit of a rocky launch, but... Um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, it, it didn't take them long to get the, the wrinkles ironed out. And yeah, man, I, I started using this in 2016. I've, you know, looked at a couple of other platforms over the years. And, um, you know, while there's some very attractive stuff out there and some really awesome pieces of kit, um, this is just for me, uh, you know, this matches my workflow the best. I do a lot of uh, like quality of life automation stuff. And I haven't really found a platform that uh, allows me to kind of dig as deep as this one does. Okay. Yeah. How many inputs are you running for this band? How many inputs am I? Let's see. We're up to uh, 52 inputs. Okay. Yeah. Um, drums? Do you want the whole... How many for drums? Shebang? Yeah. Uh, are, you, are you using uh, triggers, gates? So triggers as gates? we are using triggers for gates. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we've got, uh, yeah, it's a small kit actually. It's a four piece kit, uh, kick oh, wow. snare, two toms, handful of cymbals up there. Um, is that just for stage noise or is that uh, for the gate triggers? The, for the gates? gates? Uh, well, I mean, you know, the, the problem with gating and compressing drums is that when they open, you're bringing all the noise floor up. So it's psh, yeah. You get a lot of cymbal bleed yeah. right through those things. The triggers I have found are uh, much more reliable in terms of like, you know, when when he hits the snare, the trigger doesn't open the gate as much as the microphone on the tom would open the gate. Does yeah. that make sense? Yep. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I started doing this, I don't know, five years ago or so. And okay. I just use these little, they're cheap Pintech stick on triggers. But man, they open gates perfectly you know really really do the trick and it just allows me to really dig in a little bit harder on the compression without okay. having to worry about uh all the noise from all the cymbals and all the other drums popping through when those gates open okay so over 50 inputs with the four-piece drum set there's a lot more inputs <laughs> and there's a lot of redundance or well um yeah so we have multiple mics on the kick and snare 
Uh, and then lots of spot mics on cymbals. We've got hi-hat, ride. Uh, he's got a, like a stack and uh, China, a couple of uh, overheads up there. And, you know, that kind of stuff might not be so important in, uh, in other situations. But Luke, uh, if you guys know who Luke Holland is, he's an outstanding drummer. Mm -hmm. uh, and he plays with a lot of finesse, especially, you know, in, in some of those kind of like short transient cymbals, yeah. cowbells, yeah. stacks, that type yeah. of thing. Um, so I think it's important to, to be able to represent that to the crowd. You know, when he's doing all that stuff, it's... It's it's hard to do with just a pair of overheads, so throwing those spot mics into the mix helps with that quite a bit. What's your process into getting a good drum mix for it? Oh man, that's a loaded question. <laughs> and a lot of us take pride in getting a, a, a decent. Absolutely, uh, I decent mean that drum sound. Look, I know it's it, a very loaded question. There's a lot of layers opinion, to it, but yeah, in my opinion, uh, if your drums don't sound good, your mix doesn't sound good period you know it's in rock music anyway sure. you know it's which is what i mostly deal with uh but i mean as far as a, a method i mean you know like most of us i think i kind of start with you know uh kick snare toms find you know with the sources that are dual mic'd what's what's the majority of that sound going to come from you know what i mean kick out kick in some people have a preference i'm kind of like whatever works for whatever do band. you do both kick in and kick out kick in kick out okay although it's not really a kick out so i have uh kelly shoes in the drum Got with it. uh beta 91 and uh d6 and they're pretty much right on top of each other so it's actually just kind of like two so two ends. two flavors yeah okay got it um and uh but i do use both of them uh for for you know the bigger picture uh, but yeah, it, you know, I'll start with a little bit of that. Just kind of find what what raw mic sounds the best there. Bring the toms up to a level to where they're kind of sitting pretty with the kick and snare. And then for me, it's just all about finding where do the overheads allow all that kind of stuff to live in the big picture. Because the overheads really, I mean, there's a lot of noise from all the rest of those drums that come in there. So I feel like if you if you leave those as an afterthought, you're you're mixing against yourself ultimately you're going to run into when those overheads come in it's going to completely change everything you did so i kind of like to approach that uh from from the get-go you know what do you feel like is the biggest mistake that beginning engineers make when uh starting to mix with drums? lead kick drum <laughs> lead kick drum uh that is something that we all do i think yeah. uh you know when when you're mixing rock music it's really there's a lot of impact there and, uh, and, you know, when you're a young engineer and you're kind of feeling those subs hit you in the chest for the first time, you want more of it. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and so I hear that a lot with young engineers is just pushing that kick drum up. So it's like kick drum, vocal, and then everything else. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and it, it feels really cool. But, I, I, you know, I think most of us, once we do it for a few years, you know, you start to hear that in a mix and be like, oh, that's... So what do you find is the best way to make the kick drum stand out and not have it be overpowering and up here, but to also be like a good, you know? Man, that's that's the trick. And and honestly, there's no like, I, at least I don't have any, uh, you know, uh, tricks up my sleeve for that. It's just really, it's work, man. Sure. Like, especially when you're talking about big rooms like this, your fundamental frequency in your kick drum may or may not work yeah. in the room. You know what I mean? And so a lot of times you're fighting that low end trying to make you know as much impact as you can without um the echo the, the natural reverberation in the room just being overbearing yeah. because man that there's there's nothing worse than getting you know your mix sitting right where you like it and then when the band starts playing all together bass and, and kick drum just end up yeah. you know rattling around and and kind of destroying the fidelity of everything else so walk me through that a little bit when you're creating space for instruments instead of having them you know stack on top of that um how do you find that space to be able to put eq wise where things should be long are you spending time um, soloing it and getting that sound right and then go from there or are you looking no. at it as a full yeah i try to listen to it as a big chop. picture so so I, for example, yes, I, I, I listen to things in solo, but I don't ever really just listen to like just the bass guitar to, to dial it in, right? So I'll listen to bass, kick, and toms together. Okay. 
and uh, like a lot of mixers probably out there, you know, I'll, I'll use tricks like uh, side chain compression on the bass so it'll duck out when the kick drum hits, leave a little space there and then come back in. And also I've recently started experimenting with uh, matching the fundamentals of the kick drum with the bass guitar uh, so hmm. that like, you know, say I've got, uh, you know, a 50 to 80 hump in in the kick drum that's normally stuff that i would kind of carve out a bass guitar but uh i've found that if i if i play my cards right i might be able to actually push some of that same fundamental frequency in there and then use side side chain compression to duck it down when the yeah. kick hits and then you've just got kind of the solid beefy low end uh throughout the whole set and a lot of these bands that i mix you know the name of the game is just dense dense mix big sound like it's exploding out of the speakers kind of mix um which is really hard to do with low end but uh you know luckily there's a lot of tools out there for us to do that type of thing these days and and uh yeah that side side chain compression is probably okay. my my go-to um are you using uh any native stuff in the console or are you using waves um and um, a little bit of everything. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're talking plugins, correct? Uh, yeah, we can take a look here at what I'm using. Um, the majority of stuff that I'm using, I think, would probably be Waves. Uh, just man, I've been using these same tools for so many years. I know yeah. exactly what to expect out of them. Uh, and and there's a few of those things that I reach for time and time and time again, just because it works. You yeah. know, there might be better tools out there now, but you know, if it works for me, I don't see any reason to really go. You know throwing a wrench in it but yeah um you know uh, as far as native stuff goes uh i don't really use a lot of it i'll use like you know d-verb um you know some of the reverbs uh so these these types of things for example let me find uh so you see i've got all these d-verbs here right um what i'm actually using this for is on my uh delay for my, my main vocal delay, which I'll be riding up and down throughout the set. Um, I find that if I don't send it to reverb, it ends up being very like stark, you know, effect right in your mm -hmm. face. Hey, 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 hey. And, um, and so I, I run all my delays through the D-verb because it just works. It's, you know, you don't just turn it on, set your mix and you don't have to think about it. And it just kind of tucks that delay into the mix a little bit rather yeah. than having it so you know, right in your face. Um, but yeah, you know, I use a lot of this McDSP stuff. I absolutely love this uh, EC300. It's uh, it's a very, very cool delay that kind of lets you choose it between a few different flavors where you've got the tape delay, you've got uh, digital style delay, oh, which cool. is very clean, very, you know, what you would expect from a digital delay. Yeah. And then analog, which gives you that kind of, uh, that uh, like high-end roll off and a little bit of, uh, modulation and some dirtiness to it. It's really nice. But uh, yeah, this is kind of my go-to delay. And then, uh, man, plugins. I mean, I'm almost ashamed to admit this, but I use a lot of plugins. Oh, wow. Yeah, a lot. Do. And uh, and some of them are just, you know, utility things. But, uh, you know, for example, like, let's just go through the snare drum channel real quick here. Everybody seems to love the snare drum. So um, this is on my snare group. Uh, uh, I'm hitting it first with this analog channel from McDSP, which if you don't know, this is, this is a cheat code for a snare drum. This thing is awesome. <laughs> um, it just gives you a little bit of low bump, a little bit of saturation, and it can compress for you a little bit if you okay. want it. I don't use it that way, but uh, I, I know some people do. And then uh, I'll run it into this chain, which you can, if you take a look here, a lot of this stuff is disengaged. It's kind of like case by case, day by day. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll use torque sometimes. Uh, my drummer, as I said before, he plays with a lot of finesse, so he needs that snare to be really, really tight. And uh, if it's not giving me the punch that I need, uh, sometimes I'll use torque, which just tunes the drum down really effectively. Uh, it's it's a great plug-in. Smack Attack is another thing that I pop on and off from day to day uh, just to get a little bit more of that transient cutting through on the snare. Uh, pretty standard stuff here. Poltec style EQ. Um, a, a limiter on most of my drums, I end up running it into a limiter uh, just because I really like being able to kind of like just 
find that sweet spot where it's going to sit in the mix and uh, and get those sources compressed before it hits my mix bus um, it just allows me to like really have dynamic control of my fingers rather than just like relying on a lot sure. of um, plugins and whatnot but uh, after that uh, as you can see, I've got this rack here. Yeah, walk us through your uh, yeah. your outboard. Yeah, sure. Um, but actually, I, I, real, real quick, before we go away from this, um, do you worry about, like, with having that many plugins, like, waves crashing and going out? Has it happened to you? Man, I wish you wouldn't ask me that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it, it's I run a redundant system, so I've got two servers okay, down here. Cool. If one goes down, it switches over to the other. Sure. Um, I have had waves crash, but it was way back in the day and I was running it on like the external uh, MGB and stuff. Uh, since they've moved it over to the Waves card internally, I haven't had it crash. Cool. Uh, and, and my shows, as you can see, are pretty Waves heavy. Yeah. Um, That's so, smart for the redundant because I, I know a lot of artists who will just do one and it crashes and yeah. it's like... And then you're boned. Uh, they have an SOS, but it's still, yeah. it's a different mix. At well, the and the point. nice thing about this now with the Waves card on board is like, you don't even need that SOS. Sure. It's like if Waves crashes, the console will just turn those plugins off and keep passing yeah. audio. You know, you used to have to, you know, set that Correct. event up where yep. it unpatched everything and... The oh crap button. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah no, I, I don't really worry too much about it. Um, you know, I think the technology is getting better and more reliable every year. You know, aside from the wave stuff, I use, uh, you know, some plugins on uh, a Mac Mini. And That's man, cool. it's, you know, it's been more or less reliable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't think I'd run anything critical through it. So this is, um, I'm very proud to say I own all of this. This is my personal Good for gear. You. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a, a, a process. So. Uh, you can see I've got all this stuff and no interface or no um, stage rack, which is how most people end up patching this kind of stuff on inserts, right? Yeah, yeah the 990. Yeah. You know about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, which so, one do you use? Which preset? Uh, so I started using this Fat Reflections. Okay. Um, I know everybody uses 19 yep. for their snare. Yep. But I, I like 19, okay. but this one I, I, I bumped into it one day and i was like <laughs> Ooh. man that's really nice so that's what i use now sorry go ahead no no it's cool uh yeah so i got the bus plus uh ssl bus plus on master bus or the the band bus okay so i process the band separately from the the vocals that goes into this uh neve uh master bus transformer which is oh my god a magic box it really really is it's uh it does um, uh, shelving EQ, it does compression, which I actually don't use, uh, stereo widening and silk, which is their, yeah. you know what silk is. Yeah. But the cool thing about this is you can use red and blue silk at the same time, which is the first piece of gear you've ever been able to do it on. What? Where? So yeah, you've got red oh, and blue. Oh, look at that. You do. Yep. And... And when you turn it on, it's purple because, you know, red, red and, and blue, blue makes purple. purple. <laughs> <laughs> um, but man, this is, has been really uh, one of those pieces of gear that I, I'm having a hard time mixing without it. <laughs> I, it's like, it's like heroin. It's just like, oh, I need more, <laughs> you know? Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's my band bus. My vocal bus is really just hitting uh, this stereo compressor. It's an SSL style compressor from okay. Serpent Audio, which is an amazing piece of gear. You got a lot of 500 stuff. Yeah, and uh, and the 500 stuff, honestly, it, it looks like a lot. It's not really doing anything crazy. I just got these Cranborn Carnaby EQs. Okay. I don't know if you've seen these yet, man, but they're, it's a new, new piece of equipment. I've never seen anything like it. I don't think anyone has ever made anything like it. It's, they call it a harmonic EQ. So when you boost, you're not boosting uh, like a shelf in the traditional sense okay. where, you know, EQ uses delay to, sure. uh, uh, what you're doing actually is you're adding harmonics and saturation to the sweepable band that you're selecting. You've got three bands of it on here, high, mid, and low. And uh, <laughs> I've only been using it for about three shows, but I'm already like, I think I need more of these. Uh, it's, it's really cool, like being able to jack up high end in, in guitars and not get that, yeah. you know, painful high end. It's just, you're adding like saturation up there and it's, it does something really weird and cool and, and unique. Uh, it's a very cool piece of gear. 
Um, and then uh, all these 560s, these are, if you're familiar with the DBX 160, it's mm -hmm. the 500 version of that. And I just use it on my kick group, drum, or uh, kick group, snare group, and then my two toms individually. Okay. I don't think that there's a compressor that I like more than this oh, on wow. a drum. I think it's incredible. Uh, I've got this uh, API 527A, which is like, I, basically it's a mono version of the 2500 style EQ. I'm using that on my bass post fader, mm -hmm. uh, which is another kind of interesting thing that mm -hmm. I don't know if a lot of people are doing. I'm, no. do, I'm using this post fader, I'm using this drummer uh, on my guitars post fader, so when I push into stuff, it doesn't really get so much louder, it just gets yeah. bigger. And, and you know, uh, it's interesting doing that uh, post fader. Yeah, well, that's the idea is, you know, when I push these faders up, uh, I'm not actually turning things up so much as I'm just making them thicker. You know, they're hitting yeah. these compressors harder. And, uh, you know, when you're doing heavy music, man, that's the name of the game. Get it big, get it thick, get it <laughs> dense, you know. Um, but yeah. I mean, that's, that's the gist of it. The, the other cool piece of gear that I've got in here is this Antelope um, Galaxy 32, which does, it's basically, it's a virtual patch bay and format converter. So it does uh, MADI, Dante, Analog, ADAT, A and HDX, and allows you to patch in and out of it. It's got DSP, like the Universal Audio stuff does. So it's got its own plugins. Uh, it's a very, very cool piece of kit for one rack space, you know? Really like that thing. And then, uh, yeah, a couple of Mac Minis that just handle the, uh, the, the VST inserts and record. Okay. That's it, yeah. Awesome. It's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of stuff, but it, it's really kind of a simple chain. Oh, one thing I forgot to go through is my vocal chain here. I'm hitting this uh, Chandler TG2 preamp into the API 550A EQ. Okay. A is important on that. You okay. don't want to use the B on vocal. This is basically an 1176 compressor, which is then feeding this distressor, and that's my lead vocal chain. I think we need to give Jim the PA here. Time to shut her down? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you guys can keep going. It might not be. <laughs> Thank you for once again tuning in to This is Della Cruz. This video is sponsored by Guitar Center Professional. I know you've heard of Guitar Center. GC Pro is nationwide with professional pricing. Hit them up, link in bio. Literally, his cell phone number is going to be in my bio. His name's Greg. Hit him up. What advice would you have given yourself starting off to like to get to where you're at? Oh man, nowadays. You know, I've thought about that a lot over the years. Uh, you know, I I, I kind of got no regrets about the path that I took. However, um, you know, I know a lot of people who started off with a sound company and sure. then transitioned into doing freelance stuff. I have just been freelance my whole you career. You didn't do a production company. Never did a production company. And, uh, you know, I think that there's some, some good lessons that I learned there in terms of uh, touring and how touring works. Uh, you know, a lot of these artists and, and fellow crew members uh, came from band tours. Sure. You know? So did I. And, uh, and so I feel like that's, uh, that kind of thing is a pretty valuable lesson to learn. However, uh, you know, some of the freelance sound people who I know uh, started in production companies, and man, you get a massive jump start in knowledge sure. that way. You know, you've, you've got, you know, in some cases, decades of experience and knowledge that's just handed to yeah. you. And man, I really wish I would have had that opportunity yeah. to gain knowledge uh, at a younger age. It took me a long time to figure out some of the stuff that uh, that you know these these guys have just had handed to them. Yeah. You know, so advice. You know, I would say, hey, consider taking that uh, production company gig for at least a couple of years and just try and suck all the knowledge that you can out of yeah. it. You know, even if you want to freelance, you don't want to work for a production company long term. You know. Go get your feet on the ground, yeah. get your hands dirty, and fill your head with as much as you can. I think it's interesting when I get asked that question. It's more of a, it's a right place, right time. But I think people miss the third thing is uh, uh, being able to give them what they need at that time. Be able, yeah. um, and sometimes it's a, you know, you can only fake it till you make it so, yeah. so far. Yeah. Um, but there's some things that you learn on the road 
the uh, that it's hard to reproduce in a production house type environment. Oh, for um, sure. The process of elimination, what happens when something goes wrong? How can you figure that out yeah. right now yeah. on it? Um, and I think there's been a bit of glamorizing of touring that I think the reality is that touring can be kind of tough. Concerts are on weekends, concerts on holidays. Oh, yeah. If you want to have a family in life, it, it's, it's, it takes a, it takes yeah. a toll on uh, you. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't say that it's, uh, I wouldn't say that it's been glamorized uh, without a reason. It is a very cool job. Sure. It's a very cool job being involved with, you know, most of us who are in this business are in this business because we love music. Yeah. You know, we're, like you said before, we're failed musicians or <laughs> however you want to put it. We love music. Yeah. You know, and so being able to be a part of that for your job is pretty cool. You know, the the sacrifices that you make for that, though, are not anything to be taken lightly. Yeah. You know, a lot of people have, uh, you know, lost marriages, you know, not been able to be there for weddings and funerals and birthdays and all this kind of stuff. So there's, you know, that distance that builds uh, with your home life that takes its toll, how do you, sure. How do you find that balance of uh, not letting the pendulum swing too far over with that? How do you, how do you find that? Is it something that you do out on the road that kind of keeps you grounded? Um, I try to just, I mean, I, I talk to my wife every single day. Uh, that's- uh, Is she in the, in the industry? She is, okay. yeah. So she's uh, newer to the industry than I am, but yeah, she's in the industry, which actually makes things a bit harder, you know, because really? opposing schedules. You know, uh, sometimes when I'm off tour, she's on tour and vice versa. And yeah. so, you know, that time that we would have at home together uh, doesn't always work. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, on the flip side of that, um, both of us being in the business, uh, you know, I think lends a little bit of understanding, you know, to uh, moods that may happen or, you know, that type of thing. So it, it works out. But, yeah, I mean, as far as like staying connected, man, that's that's a number one for me is just being in touch with my wife even if it's just you know if we're busy 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 then it's text messaging all day but i really try to get on the phone with her at least once a day and um and also you know call mom once in a while check in let yeah. her know you're alive yeah <laughs> well i know there's a lot of people who look up to you as an engineer who are some people that you oh. look up to oh man i mean there's a lot of people just off the top of my head man i, I have really I've really uh, been, uh, I've really felt fortunate working with Brad on this tour. I mean, that guy is, in, in my opinion, I don't know that there's anybody doing their own band better than him right now. And I'm sorry to all my friends out there, <laughs> but my goodness, watch his show and disagree with me. Um, yeah, he, he's an, an outstanding mixer. I definitely look up to him. My friend Bob Strakel has been an inspiration for me. I, I love absolutely Bob. Love, love that guy. Bob. Um, Bob, you're amazing. For not only for sound skills, but also, man, just, you know, his kind of outlook on touring and life and work ethic and all that kind of stuff is inspiring. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I, you know, I, there's a long, long list of people who I could go through, but just suffice to say, I try to like pick things up from everybody you know, everybody I tour with, you know, Bruce Reeder, who mixes uh, Five, Five Finger, Finger Death Punch. Yeah. Uh, I, I toured with him very early in my career, and he was kind of like, you know, the big dog, yeah. you know, doing arenas and stuff. Tried to pick up as much as I could from him and, you know, keep in touch with these people over the years. And, um, you know, I, I hope that, uh, you know, I, I get to a point to where they can kind of like view me as their peer. Yeah. You know, I really do. That's yeah. something I aspire to be as peers with these people who I look up to. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, obviously people like Brad and, and Bruce and Bob, for that matter, you know, all these guys have a decade or more on me in terms yeah. of experience. So it's like, you know, I may never get there, but I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> so for somebody, how many years you've been in the industry for? Uh, about 20 years, a okay. little under 20 years touring. Um, so you've seen a lot of uh, trends within the industry for, um, where do you think the industry is 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 going next there's been a lot of advancements i remember starting off and having these consoles you have to tip over and you'd have yeah. to manually patch everything in and just even just to be able to have that in plug-in form is just do you have any racks you have to have for that now so yeah. looking for we were just talking about some spatial audio stuff that was yeah. done before atmos what do you see as the future for audio the future is ai 
So you think there's going to be no more sound people? I mean, I don't or know that there's you... going to be no more sound people, but uh, man, I am, I am absolutely convinced that within 10 years, uh, it's going to be much more of an operator kind of job than, uh, than not, not for not for everyone. Sure. But you know, especially for like kind of lower mid level bands who can't afford to to pay you know high dollar for big experience people, you know. AI is going to be it. You know, you'll, I don't know what it'll actually look like, but you know, in my mind, it's like, oh, you tell the AI, this is my kick drum, kick drum channel. Yeah. Figure it out for me. Yep. You know what I mean? Analyze and, the room, make it sound like this. Yeah. Yeah. Click, and, drag, go. and you know, you look at some of the technologies that are out there already for live sound uh, with like the Midas, the HD 96, they've got the, I, I forget what it's called, the Midas cloud or whatever, where there's all these resources online for like presets and uh, and EQ curves and all this kind of stuff that you can just download yeah. at any moment, you know. Uh, and I think that that stuff is just going to get more and more prevalent, yeah. you know, especially with, you know, touring is most artists' main source of revenue. So I feel like any place where they're able to like trim the fat, sure, not pay so many people, sure. you know, that's just going to be the way that it goes sure. and there will be those holdouts for sure you know people who understand you know that it's not it's not just you know turning faders up and, and moving knobs it's like there's a creative process and and uh, all this kind of stuff that goes into making a good mix but i i think the the technology will get good enough that you know uh a lot of those club level theater level artists will will move in that direction yeah. unfortunately you know, uh, there was something else I was going to ask, but I totally forgot what the next question was. It's because I just bummed you out, didn't no, I? No, it wasn't a bum. <laughs> it's, it's, I remember my question. How much of this do you think is um, specifically in terms of a touring person? Is it being good at your craft and being a good hang or being able to mix well with others? Is it, do you think it's OK to be the best engineer but be a dick? Or you I think mean, there are, there's more? There are some people who are like that. Sure, but or you think it's easier? To, like you could be an okay engineer, but be good, hang, or be a good uh, team player. Yeah. So uh, the hang part of it is certainly important. Yeah. Uh, I would say probably as important as skills and experience, uh, but you know that kind of changes over time too. You know, you get if you're a great hang to start with and you're just learning to be a good engineer, yeah. then you'll keep getting gigs because people want to hire yeah. you, they want to hang out with you, and that gives you the opportunity to learn yeah. and gain all that experience. And I think it's a part with being uh, being open and honest up front, you don't have to have all the answers, but if, no. you're, if you're candid from the beginning, I think, especially nowadays, people do want to help, and there's a huge shift after Absolutely. COVID with this of like, uh, it was really gate kept, and yes. um, now with a lot of those old timers that left, People are willing to kind of help people out. So, I mean, sure. guys, go and ask the questions. I'm sure he'll be able to even ask you guys, uh, answer some questions for you guys. But, yeah. I mean. I mean, uh, it's, you know, one of the things that I noticed after coming back from uh, from COVID is, yeah, we lost a lot of knowledge. I mean, there was decades, centuries of experience that left the industry yeah. during COVID yeah. and will never return, you know, and that sucks. It's awful to lose, uh, you know, all those little things that people kind of picked up over the years that, uh, you know, make a huge difference. Um, but, uh, you know, on the flip side of that, getting all the new blood in here, I think has been really, really good. It's a shot in the arm to the industry, exactly for the reason that you're talking about, which is, you know, people are happy to share. They're happy to be like, yo, what are you doing? Yeah. How do you do, how do you get that sound? Or, you know, what what's your, what's your approach to lighting this band or whatever, you know? Uh, and people are more open and honest about that kind of thing because it's like, none of us have tricks. There's no tricks anymore, you know what I mean? It's all just like, it's knowledge. You know, how much experience have you had doing this one specific thing? Or um, uh, it, I, I think it's really cool to see kind of like, you know, the generation younger than me really is, is leading that charge. Yeah. I think, you know, of like, hey, we're all in this. We're all doing this awesome thing. Yeah. Let's all be awesome at it, you yeah. know? So if these uh, guys want to follow you and your career, where can they where can they follow you at? Uh, as far as like social online? media or all, yeah. yeah, uh I've got Instagram, 
might know me as Darth Vader. <laughs> uh, and, but you know, it, it, that's about it, really. That's okay. that's all I really post on. Or a uh, falling in reverse show near them. Falling in reverse, a day to remember, yeah. other things to come. Uh, it'll yeah, come out to a show. Awesome. Say hi. Thank you guys. Cheers. I really appreciate it. <laughs>